Well, wisdom is a pretty high hurdle, uh, but uh, uh, I'm uh, delighted to be able to speak here today. I was just been blown away by this morning's speakers. Uh, everyone who, who opened my mind to a variety of additional possibilities in my life's mission, which is to solve Alzheimer's. Thank you, Glenda, for inviting me. So Us Against Alzheimer's was formed by four, four individuals, basically because our families had been affected by the disease. My late wife's mother and grandmother uh, died of this disease 25 years after her mother had been diagnosed. Nothing seemed to be happening. So in 2010, we decided, what the heck? We've got to get into this game and disrupt the heck out of what seemed to be business as usual and sort of a sluggish approach. Uh, Meryl Comer, who is with us today and many of whom you know, uh, wrote a book called Slow Dancing with Alzheimer's about her experience with her husband, she, for whom she's been an at-home caregiver for 20 two years. Jill Lesser uh, is the prototypical sandwich mother, sandwich woman, uh, with a mother with Alzheimer's and three rambunctious teenagers growing past teenage years, uh, and so she is trying to balance a life which is extraordinarily complicated on both ends. Jill is here today. She's the president of our Women Against Alzheimer's Network. So we bring a different point of view about this. We're not a professional organization in the traditional sense of a large vertically integrated organization with paid staff. We're basically putting money into it in order to drive a solution. So we're differently motivated, passionate, urgent, we're impatient, we want to disrupt things, we don't want business as usual. So we're going after it in, in spades with that point of view. And we're finding that a patient-driven organization is much more powerful as a change agent. Why? Because we're neutral. We want every company to win. We don't care which company wins. We want every company to win. We don't care uh, if, in fact, uh, one academic scientist or another gets a Nobel Prize. We'd like 100 of them to win the Nobel Prize because they found the solution to Alzheimer's. So we're basically a trusted voice that's in the middle, that's known to be neutral, there where people can gather pre-competitively across sectors uh, in order to drive a problem-oriented uh, solution. So my job today, I'm going to ask one question. How many people here have been, in their families or in the families of friends, been touched by Alzheimer's? So that's uh, two-thirds, three-quarters, and that's what you will find in virtually every audience when you ask that question. It's the most extraordinarily prevalent disease in the world today. In just a minute, I'll give you some stata statistics. So I've got about 10 minutes to basically describe three things. What's the scope and scale of the problem at a global level? What's the status of drug development and the efforts to try and find a drug-related treatment? And third, how does the brain health stuff, all of which you've been hearing about in terms of risk reduction uh, and attention to brain health, relate to drug development, if it does? So let me... I said to myself, um, aging is predictable. We know the world demographics on aging. You can predict that within 0.1%. We know that uh, the... the Incidence of Alzheimer's, pretty predictable, although to some extent it's actually uh, getting a little less, but, uh, but basically you can predict the incidence of Alzheimer's, and you can predict the cost based upon the number of cases. So what do I do? I say, look, this is the second inconvenient truth of the 21st century. We know predictably what's going to happen with this disease. And so I plotted Al Gore's famous CO2 uh, levels uh, going through time, against, in this case, the global population over 65, a remarkable strike. Now, this is, this is not to say the CO2 levels cause Alzheimer's or vice versa, but what it does say is that, in fact, we are, have a unique point in a human history where people are living over 65, they're aging. Indeed, two-thirds of the people that have ever lived past 65 are alive today, and it's only going to change. So this is the global cost of Alzheimer's. And as you can see, this is a more striking upward curve very rapidly in the coming years. The scale goes to 2050, which is about where the estimates are going. And this is the global cost and population. So 150 million people by 2050, and the costs are going to be $3 trillion to the global economy simply of taking care of those people. So, a variety of at attributes of this beyond just those numbers, which are pretty striking in and of themselves. For every person with dementia or Alzheimer's, and I'll explain in a second the difference as somebody asked me to do today, um, uh, there are two or three caregivers. 
So when you say, gee, there are going to be 50 million people with this disease, um, uh, excuse me, 150 million people with this disease by 2050, add two to three people who are caregivers to that population, and you've got 300 to 450 million caregivers. So you've got a half a billion people who essentially are not in the workforce or are not productive members of society and who are drained by the bearing of this disease. Family, it's a family disease, uh, and it's a community disease. It's not just the individual with the disease. And of course, two-thirds of the victims are women. Two-thirds of them are caregivers. Two-thirds of the caregivers are women. So women are being increasingly drawn from either lightening up their participation in the job market, going part-time, pulling back from the job market to take care of a loved one for a period of time, or even just dropping out of their career. Meryl Comer is our, our family example because she, in fact, was a prominent journalist who basically left her career to take care of her husband. This disease, at least in the United States, it treats blacks, African Americans, and, uh, and Latinos differently. Two to three times more likely, if you're uh, African American, to have this disease at any particular age. One and a half times uh, greater likelihood uh, if you're Latino as opposed to a non-Latino white. So that means that the already existing health disparities in our society are going to be aggravated to heck uh, by the increasing incidence of this disease. And because of the out-of-pocket costs associated with this disease, family incomes are going down, and we're going to see growing income inequality in this country. This is not a disease uh, that is going to be um, impacting deeply your lives, this demographic in this room, but it's going to be deeply impacting the ability of a family to support themselves in the coming years. So let's talk a little bit about the state of drug development. You've heard about all the drug failures recently. What have we learned from those drug failures? We've learned two things. Either we're going for the wrong targets, amyloid, beta amyloid, you've heard a lot about, as a toxic protein in the brain thought to be a contributor to or a trigger of this disease. Maybe that's wrong. And second, uh, we're going too late in the disease, but by the time you actually administer a treatment to somebody with symptoms, it may be too late in the course of the disease to be able to slow or stop the disease progression. And so maybe we've got to go earlier, to the very earliest stages of the disease, and maybe even to people who don't yet have the symptoms in order to administer a disease-modifying drug to slow things down uh, so that you don't get symptoms. So this is the existing drug pipeline. It's a little busy. Um, uh, but on the right, you'll see phase three drugs. And this has been pretty consistent over the years. For every drug failure, every drug that's dropped out, a new drug is entering phase three. And if you look at the left hand, that's phase two. That's up 20% year over year. So there are more drugs coming into the pipeline. And in fact, just by the array of colors, you're going to see a greater variety of drugs in phase two moving to phase three in the coming years. So you'll see stem cells on this, uh, the, the dark blue at the bottom. Uh, the stem cell therapies are on this. There are therapies that are aimed at cardiovascular implications of Alzheimer's. There are drugs that are aimed at the diabetic or metabolic implications of Alzheimer's. So there's a diversification of what's coming through the pipeline. That's good. That says, gee, if we're aiming at the wrong target, maybe in the years, two or three or four years, by the time phase two drugs get to market, or get to the phase, final phase three, we'll have some additional targets. Uh, and uh, there's still prevention drugs in the phase two and phase three, which means they're being given to people at the very earliest stage that you can detect cognitive impairment uh, and, and potentially even in pre-symptomatic populations. Let me just stop for a second. What's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Dementia is a description of a set of symptoms. It's a symptom that says cognitive impairment is inhibiting your ability uh, to perform activities of daily living. It is not a disease. Dementia is not a disease. It's not the cause of anything. Dementia is a description of the symptoms. It's like pain. Pain is not itself a disease. It's something that's causing the pain that's the disease. So with respect to dementia, Alzheimer's is the cause of two-thirds to three-quarters of dementia. But there's also frontal temporal lobe dementia that affects the front part of the brain, the executive function, starts there rather than in the hippocampus, that's the memory section. And there are other forms of the other causes of dementia. There's a broader class of diseases called neurodegenerative disease. So that would include all of the Alzheimer's and dementia-related diseases, dementia-caused diseases, but also Parkinson's, ALS, 
uh, and uh, multiple sclerosis. So how does brain health relate to this? Well, you've heard a lot about uh, all of the various things that are going on in the brain health space. We now can identify the risk factors, uh, many of the risk factors for Alzheimer's, whether it's cardiovascular, diabetic, lack of sleep, overstress, um, sedentary lifestyle, you name it. You've heard it all this morning, uh, and we heard it all yesterday at the, at the uh, access circles uh, convening around women's brain health. We know a lot of the risk factors for Alzheimer's. And we know that, in fact, you can reduce those risk factors or mitigate them. We also know that, in fact, you may be able, through a variety of interventions that don't relate to drugs, to actually reduce your risk for Alzheimer's, defer it, or maybe even avoid it. Because just because you have cognitive impairment doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's. There are lots of causes of cognitive impairment that can be treated. So all of our shyness about going to the doctor and asking about, gee, I don't feel well with the brain, Ask, because the doctor should be able to treat many causes of cognitive impairment that has nothing to do with Alzheimer's. So I would suggest that, in fact, everything you've heard today has got some scientific basis to it, a lot of scientific basis to it. And the studies are now going on to figure which are the best ones, because one of the great challenges is to figure out which is the most productive, what is the most impactful of these risk reduction strategies. And then the great, great challenge is, how do we change our behaviors in a way that will reduce the risk? Because I'm looking at 150 million people with Alzheimer's or dementia around the world in the next 35 years. And all of the things that you hear about are probably attuned to the private payer, top one to 2% of wealth in the United States. Not much diversity in this room, ladies and gentlemen. Not much socioeconomic diversity, uh, not much uh, racial diversity in this room. And I would submit to you that while we can each look at all of what we've heard about what we ought to do in our own lives, until we find an effective way to scale non-therapeutic interventions, which is what you're going to hear about, diet, exercise, and other interventions, we're only going to be dealing with a very thin layer of the global problem that we're confronting. So with that, Thank you very much for your time, and we'll get on to the panel. <laughs>